So let's go a little bit into Alzheimer's and uh, dementia here, because I know you guys are experts in this field. And uh, there's a strong connection between Alzheimer's and insulin resistance, as well as dementia and insulin resistance. So can you guys give us a little insight here into how insulin resistance can affect your risk for dementia and or Alzheimer's? So I'm going to describe the, the, the differential between dementia and Alzheimer's and you can, uh, so dementia is the bigger category. It's the umbrella category. Anytime you have cognitive decline to the extent where you can't do one of your daily activities like finances and, and driving or any of that, but that's a rough definition of dementia. And it has to be sustained, you know, uh, not necessarily irreversible, but at least sustained because that's how you dis dif differentiate between dementia and delirium. Delirium is when that momentary, uh, you know, um, a period where you can't, you don't know where you are and, and you're confused, but usually people go back to normal. But dementia is a sustained cognitive decline to the extent that they can't do their daily activities. But there are many types of dementias. The biggest one is Alzheimer's. 60 to 70% of all dementias is Alzheimer's. Then, you know, you have your Lewy body disease, your vascular dementia, your frontotemporal lobe dementia, your, you know, Huntington's dementia, and many other dementias. But Alzheimer's is the biggest category. Up to now, we've defined Alzheimer's clinically by this. By the way, when, as the diseases continue, they all start looking the same because as they progress, all parts of the brain are involved, right? So you can't tell the difference later on. But it's early on that you can tell the difference. For example, Alzheimer's early on, invariably, usually a man that comes to us and says, you know, I'm fine. I can remember 50 years back, but I just, I just forget what I had for breakfast. Well, that's it. That's Pat Numa. That's symbolic of Alzheimer's. Short-term memory disproportionate to long-term memory. The short-term memory centers of the brain, the hippocampus, are affected very early, disproportionate to any other part of the brain. That's Alzheimer's, and there's a pattern to it. And usually the protein that accumulates is the two proteins, two bad proteins, amyloid and tau. Uh, for front, frontal temporal lobe dementia, as the name implies, it's frontal lobe and temporal lobe, usually behavior disorders or language disorders. Lewy body disease, there's hallucination, visual spatial changes, and movement disorder together, and, and so on and so forth. But with Alzheimer's especially, but, 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 but with most dementias, but especially Alzheimer's, we now know that in a great majority, not all of them, but a great majority, insulin resistance happens quite early. Yeah. And, and even before, you know, amyloid deposition, we believe. And, and they start damaging the microvasculature and then, and then they start affecting, um, you know, other parts of the brain. But now we know that even other diseases like Parkinson's have insulin resistance early on. In fact, one of the studies we did in Cedars, we were involved in uh, the treatment of the insulin resistance as a treatment of uh, Parkinson's. So insulin resistance happens very early in all of these diseases, but especially in Alzheimer's. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so going back to the second part of this question, um, how does insulin resistance, how is it associated with Alzheimer's disease? Um, when you look at the function of insulin in the brain, it has so many responsibilities. It has a responsibility to um, you know, provide glucose for brain cells as a fuel. It actually is involved in synaptic function, so message transfer from one cell to another. It is responsible for the integrity of the brain and in the you know, creation of the structural, in, the infrastructure of the brain as well. So during insulin resistance, a couple of things happen that is usually, you know, the, the, the beginning of a very vicious cascade that leads to neurodegeneration and cell death. Um, two of the processes that have been very well studied is accumulation of abnormal proteins, tau and amyloid. Now, tau and amyloid, they're proteins that are involved in Alzheimer's disease. Usually, we, we keep on creating these abnormal proteins, but they get extruded from the brain. Our brain and our body has the capacity to get rid of all these waste products. But during insulin resistance, something happens to certain enzymes, kinase enzymes, which actually makes them insoluble and then they deposit. So tau protein gets hyperphosphorylated mm -hmm. and they get deposited in the brain. Uh, the tau protein uh, are proteins that stabilize the microtubules in the cells. All cells have microtubules, and microtubules are the scaffolding and highways within cells. And these little tau 
molecules stabilize them. When they get hyperphosphorylated, they come off and the scaffolding falls apart. Right. So there is one kinase that is the glycogen synthase kinase 3 or GSK3. That actually gets damaged with, during insulin resistance and that starts the whole path, pathway of hyperphosphorylation of tau molecules. The other thing that happens in the brain during insulin resistance is an overproduction or overexpression of amyloid precursor protein. So this amyloid APP is responsible for making amyloid. So too much amyloid is, is made and they get deposited uh, and they get deposited inside the cell um, and they cause damage to the infrastructure of the brain. So when there is a lot of these waste products that are produced and the brain doesn't have the capacity to get rid of it, it damages the cells, it damages the synaptic um, you know, connections between the cells. Um, at the cellular level, it causes mitochondrial dysfunction. And all of this cascades into neuronal death and apoptosis. And if that wasn't enough, if the right amount of insulin and, and I'm going to come back to right amount, right amount. People think it's binary, insulin or no insulin, or, or you know, no, the right amount is not, a, then a apoptotic process also is initiated. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. Right. And, and when, so, so all these cascades are dependent on insulin. Now, the right amount, by, by, by right amount, let me give you a little story. So um, we, this is 2002, 2001. And um, I'm at an IH, and we uh, the, the, one of the decisions was uh, made um, and, uh, at the time was, you know, in, in Parkinson's, the substantia nigra, it's a small area the size of the tip of your uh, pinky that creates uh, dopamine, <clears throat> starts dying out in Parkinson's. In fact, by the time that when you see the first tremor in Parkinson's, the first tremor, 80% of substantia nigra is gone by then. So they said, what if we put stem cells in that area, right? New cells that create dopamine. So lo and behold, that's done. But what happens is it produces a little more than expected. It doesn't release it in the right way that substantia nigra usually does. And if people who know the pathway of the brain, it's a circuitry. It's a complete electronic circuitry, on, off, on, off, on, off, like multiple circuits. Even if you put a lesion here, you know, it throws things off. So the, the right amount of dopamine was not released. And these patients got such tremendous tremors that they would lose one to two pounds of weight every day. And they would have such dyskinesia that they would break bones. <clears throat> so what's the point of that story is that just because you provide something, and you know, I come back to key, key, you know, uh, ketogenic diet and all, just because you give energy, it doesn't mean that you've given it the right energy or it ha has positive effect long-term. Forget about keto ketones, even glucose. If it's not given the right tonic release and the right dose and the right phases, it can cause long-term damage. We're magical thinkers. We think, oh, just it's going to be fine. We're, it's not. That's why the right kind of energy, the right amount uh, is critical. That's why you know, insulin resistance is, is a very, very, very important concept because it's not just the fact that you're not getting the right amount of uh, glucose in. You're affecting multiple pathways in the brain with the study we did, was it two years ago? Yes. Um, the yes. insulin resistance paper. We looked at NHANES, have, yeah. which is a nationwide database, uh, uh, quite valuable. I know that we use home IR, but that's okay. Let's, let's just think that we did the best. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so yeah. we actually excluded diabetics from that population and looked at cognition. And even pre-diabetics with insulin resistance had cognitive decline or lower cognitive state because it was uh, cross-sectional, so you can't say decline. So it had lower cognitive state. Insulin resistance is to us one of the most important and easily treatable concept yes. for the entire body. Why not focus on that early enough? I mean, the, the latest data on children, 12 years old, obesity, and, it, and of course, with that comes insulin resistance, white matter disease in the brains of 12 year olds. Yeah. So when you guys talk about insulin resistance and diabetes, I, we are fully on board. We, we consider ourselves di di diabetologists like you guys, because if just focusing on that changes the entire health spectrum, not just the brain, but, but every system. You're absolutely right. And I'm actually glad that you put a focus on um, making- I was trying to make you happy. Thank you. Thank you. you you've done good. You've done well. Yeah. Um, what I love is that you, you put a focus here on um, making people understand that insulin is not the enemy. Insulin has never been the enemy. Insulin no. will never be the enemy. 
glucose is not the enemy. Glucose will not be the enemy. It's when insulin and or glucose are out of balance um, under, in, as opposed to what they would normally be doing in their normal physiological state. So we tell people this all the time. We say, listen, insulin is not your enemy. It's excess insulin beyond your physiological requirements that can increase your risk for many chronic diseases. And what you guys are saying is that in your brain, when you have either excess insulin that cannot communicate with neurons properly, or correct me if I'm wrong, an insulin deficiency, either one of those, too much insulin or not enough insulin, can cause severe and profound neurological problems. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and it starts very early because, right. I mean, we're talking about, we think that it starts at birth. I mean, when is the brain growing the fastest? You know, in the first few years of life, when yeah. does it need yeah. the appropriate amount of energy? And you're giving them sugary, you know, foods, fatty foods. And, and if you measure the, 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 the insulin levels in those poor kids, it's fluctuating up and down like crazy. And, and they have insulin. Now we know that there are, you know, there's epidemic of diabetic uh, type 2 diabetes in children. There's epidemic of, uh, uh, you know, insulin resistance in children. We have to address it properly. We have to address it with food. We have to address it in a way that it's not just replacing one or, you know, lower. It's, you know, homeostasis or a state of equilibrium that needs to be achieved. And how do you achieve that? Not, you know, just with pills and it has to be achieved with, uh, with lifestyle. 